Please join me in welcoming Regina Holiday. I am super excited to be here. Uh, this is, I have been to Madison before. I've been to Madison before once to speak, but I've also been to Madison before in the life that I lived before I hit healthcare. Um, after many, many years of marriage, my husband and I had never had a family vacation uh, with our children. And uh, we had always visited relatives because my family's from Oklahoma and his family's Maryland. That meant every time we had vacation, we had to go visit relatives, which is not a vacation. <laughs> So, so in the summer of 2008, there was a film conference here at this hotel. And for the first time ever, we went to some place that was not family for our family trip. And my husband was so incredibly proud to come here to Madison, Wisconsin and attend a cognitive film conference. And I was so honored to get to come too with our kids and learn about how cool Madison was and get to go to the free zoo that's here because it's just really epic. So, so uh, there's a really soft spot in my heart for being here. Speaking of my sons, that's a painting of my son, my son Isaac. He was a little tiny, bitty baby, like a two-year-old when we came to Madison. Um, and here's a little older in this picture. And if you notice, there's a whole bunch of toys behind him. And those are real toys that actually existed for many, many years. And those toys helped you learn how to be a patient. Um, they, they helped you in your role. And I worked in a preschool for many years, so I did the kind of role playing with children that you need to do to learn how to live as a human being. And there's all these amazing toys and play that children do. And one of those is where a, a child will have a chalkboard and they'll be drawing on it. They'll line a whole bunch of stuffed animals up in front of them. And they are playing a game and it is called school. And if there's a child who has a cash register and another one has a shopping cart, putting all the plastic food in, they're playing a game called store. And if you have two children and one is seated doing absolutely nothing and one has a stethoscope, they're playing another game. It's called doctor. See, for many, many years, children were taught to be a patient is to sit there and not act. My son got to go to a clinic appointment in Washington, D.C., a clinic, okay? And that's where they, you just can walk in and they will see you. And he was a little bit sick that day, so we went in. And we went to the receptionist, and she handed us a network computer, like a little netbook. And she said to my son, you can start building your medical record. And my son was five. And um, we took the netbook off to the side, and we started typing, and we asked questions, and I asked him questions about his life, and we typed them all in. And then we pushed the button that said submit, and then we tried to give the netbook back. And the receptionist said, oh, no, no, you can use it to surf the web while you're waiting for the doctor, which my son was like, yes. And, and so then he took the netbook in with him to the appointment with the doctor. The doctor ta started talking to him about his eye condition that he had, and then started Googling what was wrong with my son on the netbook and they were talking about it together and he was pointing to pictures and he was explaining the entire situation and then the doctor E prescribed the prescription that my son needed and by the end of the appointment he was literally strutting out of the doctor's office. He totally owned this. And then just a couple weeks later it was his six year old appointment and he went to his regular doctor and the regular doctor turned her back to us and typed in a computer and asked me all the questions. And my son started getting the wiggles up on the table. And he literally jumped off and walked up to the doctor and said, when's it my turn to type? <laughs> yeah. So that is the kind of patients that are coming. So that is what my son did when he was six. What I did when I was six was very different. See, I was a poor child growing up in Oklahoma. I didn't understand how to read. I spent my first year grade teaching year trying to understand what my teacher was saying when she said A is for apple. And I said, okay, get it. A equals apple. And unfortunately, no, there's this thing called phonics. <laughs> you have to sound things out. And I didn't understand her. So I started drawing everything. And I drew everything my teacher said. And if you draw constantly in class, you know what your teacher does? She sends you to the office, okay? And when you get there, the principal is not there. And what the secretary does is she gives you crayons and paper and you get a draw. So, so I spent the whole year doing that. And at the end of my first grade year, I got a piece of paper and it had a picture of a bee buzzing by on it. And my, my mom read it to me because I couldn't read it. And she said, well, Regina, it says you'll be back. You'll be repeating first grade. And so the next year I went back to first grade and it was really hard because all my friends had moved on. And I was in the overflow classroom in the basement next to the boiler. <laughs> it was so dark and dank. And then at recess, what I would do is I would draw on that wall. So that wall was right on my playground. And I would take shale and chalk, and I would draw on it, and I would draw on it. And at six years old, that's how it got me through a lot of painful times in my life. 
Now, what was a bright spot in my life was television. So I was in Oklahoma, my future husband was in Maryland, but we were both watching 1970s, 1980s television. Oh, it was a golden age. But anyway, what was amazing is it taught me how to be a patient. These kind of characters, like Grandma Walton, great character, amazing lady, I loved her. And then one time she was just gone. She just disappeared from the show. Well, a year later she came back. It turned out the actress who had played the part had had a stroke and her face had fallen and she couldn't use her mouth very well. But she came back years before ADA had ever passed. She was brought back because she was important. And that was important to me because my mother had Bell's palsy later that year and I watched her face fall. But I knew she'd get better because of Grandma Walton. Then there's uh, Quincy, Quincy and me, love that show. What I didn't know at the time was Jack Klugman, who played the character of Quincy, he was testifying before Congress on a piece of legislation called the Orphan Drug Act. He was the first celebrity testimony, he filled the entire room. And a man who played a doctor on television helped pass a piece of legislation to that to this day makes sure patients can get the care they need. How about Hawkeye Pierce there at the top? Love that show. My husband loved that show so much that when I met him in college, he still had camouflage bedding and curtains in his room, okay? Um, and we all, all watched that last episode, and I bet most of you in this room watched that last episode of MASH. It had the most watched episode of television until the 2010 Super Bowl, and this was the early 1980s. And that night, we got to watch a character that we loved have a complete nervous breakdown. See, this doctor that we had cared about for so many years, he was on a bus, and there was a woman on the bus, and she was holding a chicken, and the enemy was outside, and he told her, you have to make the chicken be quiet. And she did. And as the episode unraveled, we started realizing it wasn't a chicken, it was a baby. And a mother had suffocated her own child on a bus. And he was a doctor, and he'd caused harm. And we as a nation dealt with that. What happened in the years hence that we don't talk about these things anymore? How about the other characters? In Incredible Hulk, that was family programming. The Avengers brought that character back. Super exciting. Watch the first episode again. Watch an episode where somebody loves their spouse so much and they can't stop them from dying and then they decide to spend the rest of their life doing whatever they can to make things better. Medically, the one that's most important in that painting to me is uh, Mary Ingalls Wilder there. <laughs> um, pardon me, Mary Ingalls, both sister was Wilder. Um, she was in an episode of Little House on the Prairie and she needed glasses. So, so we were watching this episode where Mary needs glasses, even called Mary needs glasses. And, and we were watching, and I said to my mom, Mom, I'm just like Mary, I need glasses. And I'm pinching my eyes, and I'm squinting at the chalkboard. And she says, oh, Regina, you don't need glasses, you're in fourth grade. And I said, yes, yes, I do. Now, we were an uninsured family, which meant you did not go to the doctor, okay? So, so if you were just sort of sick, that is what Vicks Vapor Rub is for, okay? <laughs> you were so sick that you could not get out bed, then, then mom would lift me up, carry me to the doctor's office, sit me down at the table, and that doctor would look at my eyes, nose, and mouth, and then he would walk away and go to my mom and say, Mrs. McCandless, your daughter has another tonsil infection, here's a prescription, make sure you fill this, and get back in two weeks if she doesn't get better. And then he would just walk out of the room. Well, the eye doctor was completely different. When I went to the eye doctor for the first time, he took me into this room and then he dimmed the lights and he had me sit on this chair that was like a throne. And then once I was seated there, he started sliding these glass slides in front of my eyes and he said, is this one better or this? A or B, one or two? And I'm answering him and answering him and as I'm answering him, I'm realizing I'm in charge of a grown man and he's a doctor. And he's doing everything I say. And as the glass slides slid into place, I could see again. And then two weeks later, my glasses came. And I could see the leaves on trees again. And it was amazing. Fourth grade was a spectacular year. I got glasses that year. My grades started going up. My teacher, Mrs. Graham, she realized I was not stupid. I had something called dyslexia. And she gave me an IEP plan, an individual education plan, before anybody did that kind of thing. And when I got a report card, I got A's. I got A's for the first time, and I was so happy. And when she was putting out my report card, she asked me how to spell McCandless. And I said, well, I think it's an M, and then a big C, and then a little C. And she says, are you sure? I said, yeah, I think it's the web that way. So she wrote it that way because she loved me. And then I brought that home to my dad. 
And it wasn't enough that I was considered slow. It wasn't enough that I was poor. My dad was an abusive alcoholic. So when he read that my name was spelled wrong on my report card, he began to write horrible things to my teacher. And I couldn't let him do that, because she'd done nothing wrong. So I told my dad, I'm the one who told her to write it that way. And so he took a heavy hairbrush that was sitting on the counter, and he smacked me on the side of the head with it. And I began to cry, and I had a welt on my face, and I had to go to school that way. And I went to my teacher, and I just sat out in the hallway. I couldn't go in the classroom. And she came out, and she asked me what happened, and I told her everything he had done to me for all the years since I was a little child. And she told me to get Kleenex and wipe my face off and come back to class. And nothing happened. See, we would have visitors at my school. We had the firefighter. He taught us stop, drop, and roll. We had the dentist. He gave us the pink tablets that turn your teeth all red. Well, after I talked to my teacher, we had a police officer come to my class, and she, he brought this piece of paper. See, those are hotline numbers for Creek County, Oklahoma. And he told the kids in the classroom, some of you may see abuse in your life, and when abuse becomes too bad, call these numbers. There are going to be people when you get back home that tell you words don't matter. Oh, they very much do. See, what I heard was when the abuse becomes too bad, that means everything that's already been done to me so far is just really not bad enough, and I'm just going to have to wait till it gets worse. So for seven years, I kept that piece of paper in my bureau drawer until the day my dad got a gun out and tried to kill the whole family. And that's the day I called the number. I managed to get out of high school. I managed to graduate. <laughs> I managed to even get into college. In college, I met this amazing man named Frederick Allen Holiday in a scenic painting class. See, we were both procrastinators. And so we would show up at 10 o'clock at night, and the project would do at 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, we, would, we, <laughs> we would have these huge arguments all night long because, see, I was a Lutheran, and he was a Catholic. And um, I was a Garth Brooks fan, and he was a Metallica fan. And, you know, I was a Democrat, and he was whatever was not a Democrat. And <laughs> we just fight. The one thing we had in common was Stephen King. We loved Stephen King, the dark tower and the stand, and we would talk about that. And by 3 o'clock in the morning, we'd be throwing paintbrushes at each other. You've got complete filter failure at 3 a.m., okay? So if you're going to fall in love with someone, this is the best way to do it. And after an entire semester of doing this, we realized we were in love and decided to get married. So, years passed. I dropped out of school and began to support my husband as he got a master's degree and a PhD, and he wrote his dissertation on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There is not a lot of jobs in that field, I will warn you. <laughs> then we had two kids, Freddie in 1998, Isaac in 2006, and our life was rolling along. Um, in Christmas time of 2007, my husband and I, between the two of us, were working six jobs, okay? And between the two of us and our six jobs, we still couldn't afford health insurance for the whole family. See, we lived in Washington, D.C., where you can choose. You can either pay health insurance or you can have an apartment. But you really can't have both of those things. So we had a one-bedroom apartment. We were struggling. This painting was, this picture actually was taken at 9 o'clock at night by Olin Mills Photography at my church. Aren't they great? I can't believe we looked that good at 9 o'clock. I, I had been working all day in a toy store at Christmas time. So, you know, that puts it in perspective. In January of 2008, we had New Year's resolutions, and you know, I know people joke about them, but these were real serious New Year's resolutions. They were things like, we need to get medical insurance for the whole family. Fred needs to get a job in his field. Little Freddie, he, he, he needs to get into a school for autism, because he'd gotten diagnosed with autism. We need to spend more time together as a family. And finally, we were a family of four with two children with special needs living in a one-bedroom apartment. We needed to get a two-bedroom apartment. That was all we were asking for, and we were blessed by God. Because in the summer of 2008, on top of coming to Madison, Wisconsin, my husband found out he was hired by American University, which would give him health insurance and for our family and would give us more time together to spend as a family. We found out our son Isaac got into a special needs school called Ivy Mount, and he would get the care that he needed. Everything was rolling along except for the two-bedroom apartment, but we thought that's coming. Fred was super proud of his job. He was super proud of his business card he handed out to everybody. The only thing that was frustrating was he was really tired and fatigued. Now, he'd been losing weight all summer, and he was so good at it, he started dieting to lose more weight. And when he went to the doctor, they diagnosed him with hypertension. And I thought, that's odd, because he's like dropped 60 pounds. Why would he get diagnosed with hypertension now? 
They said, well, it's genetic. His mom has hypertension. If you read my husband's Facebook post in January and February and March in 2009, you'd probably notice that he's in a lot of pain. He complains constantly about how much he hurts, how sick he feels, how tired he is. In January of 2009, he went to the local ER because his ribs hurt so bad. It turned out they were broken. They thought maybe because he'd been coughing because he had had a cold. In March of 2009, well, pardon me, February, he started having excruciating lower back pain, kept going back to the doctor for that, kept getting pain medications. By March of 2009, he was on a whole bunch of medicine, four types of uh, painkillers, two types of muscle relaxants. He was taking four types of laxatives, all of these to maintain a life where he could go to work, yet we did not have a diagnosis. On March 13th of 2009, we went to the local ER that was the pretty one, the one that had the stained glass windows and the coffee shop and the gift shop, and we waited for three hours for someone to see my husband, and after three hours, someone came out and said, we're backed up, there'll be no MRI or CT scan, you might as well just go home and here's some more pain medication. The next day, I went with my husband to the doctor. Um, and when I went in, the doctor, basically, the staff, said he could just go in into the room. And I said, aren't you going to weigh him? They said, we don't always weigh our patients. I'm like, really? My doctor always weighs me. We have these long conversations right after. <laughs> you know, you really should weigh your patients because it's a sign of their condition. Like, for instance, he's dropping weight, and you need to know that. They said, you can just go into the room. And we did. And my husband laid down on the table because he hurt so bad. And the doctor came in with a flip chart and she said, so Mr. Holiday, do you think maybe you're depressed? And we laughed at her. We said, of course he's depressed. He hurts all the time at this point. I want an MRI and I want it to be one of those open kinds. I've read about them because he's claustrophobic. And we want it this week because I'm worried something may be wrong with his kidneys. And she said, oh, no, it's probably a protuberance of lumbar five. Some people need surgery. Some people don't. I said, we need an MRI, and we need it this week. And guess what? In Olney, Maryland, a little community outside of Washington, D.C., they had an open MRI, and they could see him. So we went all the way out there, and he drove his car, and he got the CD, and he drove it all the way back into his doctor's office, and he left it with her, and then four days later, she called us. She called us to say that there were tumors and a shadow, potentially, on the CD, and that she, sh she should see an oncologist. Here is the number that we should call, and then click. And I had to look up what an oncologist was. I didn't know it was a cancer doctor. And we made the phone call, and we made the appointment, and we went to the doctor's office. And the doctor's office was right next to the hospital, and when the doctor could see Fred could barely walk, he said, we should just admit you for tests. So Fred was admitted on March 25th, 2009, and I left him there. See, I didn't know you don't leave patients by themselves in hospitals. I had two little kids at home, and I was supposed to take care of them. I was supposed to go to work at the toy store, and I thought hospitals are safe places to leave your loved ones. On March 27th, 2009, I was working at a toy store. My boss handed me a telephone and said, Reggie, it's your husband. And Fred was crying. See, the doctor had just been in his room and had told him he had tumors and growths throughout his abdomen, a three-centimeter tumor in his kidney, and he was so frightened. Can I come as soon as possible? Because I don't understand what's going on. And so I left, and I didn't drive. So my boss's wife, she drove me to the hospital, and I got there as fast as I could, and I went to my husband, I hugged him, and then I went to the nurse's station and said, I want to talk to the doctor who just spoke to my husband, who told him a whole bunch of things. I want to find out what's going on. And the nurse said, well, your doctor has left town for a medical conference. He'll be gone for the next four days. He wouldn't return phone calls or emails the entire time he was gone. I went up and down the hallways of the hospital. There are these computers. The computers have the medical records on them. And I went up to people and said, can I please read the medical record? And they said, we can't show you that. You need to talk to your doctor. We talked to the nurses. They're like, no, no, you need to go talk to your doctor. And we sat and we sat in this horrible purgatory waiting. And we had more tests done. And on the fourth day, an on-call doctor came in the room. And we asked her, um, what about the test? He had more tests. He had a PET scan. He had a bone scan. What are the results of the test? And she looked at us and she said, you mean no one's talking to you? We're like, no, no one talks to us. She said, well, it's everywhere. It's spread into his bones and his lungs. And that night, I went home and I typed my husband myself. 
he had stage four kidney cancer. When the doctor got back in town from his medical conference, not long after, he went to my husband at 7.30 rounds, and he said, so Mr. Holliday, I understand your wife has been asking questions about this case. And Fred was worried. He didn't want to be that patient that causes trouble. You see, he'd worked in the food industry for many years, and he knows exactly what happens to your hamburger if you complain about it. <laughs> it's like, Reggie, don't make waves. The doctor said, well, if little Miss A-type personality has questions, she should come to my office hours to ask them. And this is a painting of that day. And it's true to the day, except for they did give me a chair, but I was emotionally kneeling. The doctor never closed the door. He never stopped taking phone calls while he tried to talk with me. This one nurse by the doorway, she's complaining about the parking lot and how that one employee keeps parking in the wrong place. Our friend in blue, she's the tech transport. She wants to know if Miss Rosen's chemotherapy suite will be available later today. And the doctor, between all of this, is speaking so fast and using words I don't understand. I say, please, please, could you slow down because I don't understand these terms and I have to research them online. And he said, I don't like people who research online. I said, I'm sorry, but my only way to understand you is to research these terms because I don't have a background in medicine. And he said, that's right. I'm the one with a medical degree. So if you look at that wall in the background there, it looks like there's a diploma on the wall. But that says, I have the medical degree. And if you look at the little portrait off to the side, it's a portrait of his family, but I don't think it was done by Olin Mills Photography. And if you look at the shadow in the background, the very shadows, that's our family. Because this is just the moment in a busy workflow of a doctor's life, but this is the moment that our family is breaking apart. Whoops. I'll try to go back. Okay, some people say to me, Regina, you just had a bad doctor. And if you had had a good doctor, there would be no story. And I say, I only have 50 minutes to talk to you. Because there were so many things that wrong, went wrong. OK, how about this? Only a closed MRI at that facility. And my husband's horribly claustrophobic. So I say, please, please, can I go in with him and calm him down? And they said, we do not allow that. No, we'll just double dose him with Ativan, which of course still did not work. So he's trying to get this procedure done. And the tech runs out to me and says, we cannot calm him down. You need to get in there and calm him down. Give me your ring. Give me your watch. OK, I'm being robbed, but I hand them over and I walk into the room. And then the minute the machine goes on, my name tag flies right into the chamber. Because I wasn't asked, do you have anything metal on you? Or how about ambulance transport? So we were told there's such a thing as palliative radiation. And we asked, what is that? And they said, it will make the bone pain stop. And Fred's like, yes, anything that stops the bone pain. And then an ambulance transport crew with full rain gear comes in our room. And we say, what's going on? We're taking you to radiation, they say. We say, wait a second, that's downstairs. They're like, no, 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 no. Radiation is across town. You're going to have to take an ambulance. Now, it was the first day for one of the techs to transport. So when you do a transport bed lift, you lift and go over. But what she did instead was shove. What she didn't realize was she shoved a point of metastases in Fred's hip. And that's when his hip broke while hospitalized. So I found out there's this place called Medical Records. It's in the basement of the hospital. And they're supposed to give you your medical record. So I went down there and said, I want my husband's complete medical record. And they said, that will be 73 cents per page and a 21-day wait. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's right there in your computer. All you've got to do is print. It's an active file. You're not going to a file cabinet. He's upstairs right now. Just push print. And they said, this is just the way it is. Well, remember, we're huge Stephen King fans, right? So, so that year, 2009, was when Under the Dome was coming out. And this was the holy grail of Stephen King books, and everybody wanted to read it. And my husband was looking at his disease and looking at his trajectory and said to me, Reggie, what if I don't make it to the fall of 2009? So I emailed the book buyer at my toy store. She emailed the publisher's rep, who emailed the marketing director, who emailed Stephen King, and said, can we get your new book? for this patient in Maryland with cancer? And Stephen King said yes. So in seven days, through email, we were able to get a book by an A-list author seven months before publication, when we couldn't get to the medical record in the facility we are currently admitted. This was a Saturday. Every Saturday, what I would do is I would, I would wrap little presents for the kids. 
and I would wrap them up and I would hide them in the room so when they came on Sunday, it wouldn't be so bad. Because, you know, they're little kids and they're both special needs. One's ADHD, one's autism. And, you know, they just can't be quiet. So if we can just calm them down and make them happy, this won't be so bad. And this morning, when I was standing there wrapping the little presents, the doctor came in, which was weird on a Saturday. And he stood at the threshold. And he, oh, he was not much further away than you are right now. And he stood in the doorway, and we had a list of questions in case the doctor came in the room. And there were questions like, when are we going to get surgery? When are we going to get chemotherapy? When are we going to get a palliative pain consult? When are we going to get a walker so we can try to walk again? And the doctor said, don't worry about the questions. We've decided to send you home on a PCA pump. And we began to cry. Because we knew what that meant. They didn't even have the bravery to say the words of what that meant, but that means hospice, and that means you were sending us home to die. What about surgery? How are we even going home, I ask him. We have a one-bedroom apartment. We have two little children. One has autism. One is three. And it's not even handicap accessible. So how are we going home? And he said, well, that will be a question for the discharge nurse on Monday. And he left us in a hospital on a Saturday. And that is when my husband, the nice, kind man that he was, turned to me and said, Reggie, <laughs> you go after them. You try to get me care. And I fought five days to get a transfer to another facility for a second opinion. It was so bad the nurse navigator with my insurance company was crying to me on the phone, saying how hard it was to get transfer. And she even said, I, I want to bring my Ford Explorer to the hospital. We will load him up and we will just drive him someplace else. <laughs> I said, you know insurance is never going to approve that. <laughs> we have to do it the right way. So finally, we were transferred. But we were transferred with an out-of-date and incomplete medical record and transfer summary. It was two weeks old. That meant my husband could get no care other than a bed while they tried to recreate the medical record using a phone and a fax machine. They didn't even have dietary orders, so the nurses said, we can't even feed him. But we won't notice if you go down to the basement and get him a slice of pizza from the pizzeria. The next day, Fred's doctors came to me and uh, said, we got enough to get him stable, but we need to know what's happened to him. So we need his entire medical record. We're sending you back to the first facility to get it. And I laughed in their faces. <laughs> and I said, they're not going to give it to me. I've been trying for four weeks for them to give me the medical record. And they said, they're going to give it to you this time because you're getting it for us. We're sending you as a courier. The old hospital printed out the medical record in an hour and a half for the new doctors. And they looked at it for about an hour. It was this thick. And then they handed it to me, and I said, uh, uh, <laughs> you said this is important. You said this was something that you needed. They said it is important, and we do need it, but we have nowhere to put it. So we're going to give it to you. And I read it, and I was furious because it had medical error in it, but it also had tons of actionable data that had not been acted upon. So what was I going to do with this? I was a nobody. I was a retail sales clerk that occasionally did murals. Well, I spammed a 1,000 of my friends and said, I need a white wall that I can paint my husband's medical record on. And that's what I did. I took the nutrition facts label, compared it to my husband's medical chart, showed where he should stand based on his age and weight, and showed where he really was. Then added an anatomy drawing that showed all tissue meds, the fact that he was incontinent on a PCA pump. And then I painted it on the wall of a delicatessen for thousands of people to see. And it says on it, why do we have more access to information on a box of Cheerios that we do to our own medical record. I also use Facebook as a caring bridge. And it was amazing, all the friends that we made during that time. I didn't want a closed community. I wanted an open one. And thousands of people followed us on our journey. All along the hospitalization, we kept being told we were going to get chemotherapy, and it kept not happening. And <laughs> in the, third, the second hospital, we were finally like, why are we never getting it? And it turned out the hospital pharmacy was kicking out the order every time because it was too expensive. So the nurse navigator had to coach me on how we could get that prescription utilizing a specialty pharmacy. And it had to be mailed to my home and brought to the hospital. It was $40,000 for one month supply of the recommended drug for my husband. Unfortunately, by the time he got it, he was too sick to take most of the prescription. So I ended up making art out of all 
remaining pills. Because back in 2009, there was no legislation being passed that we could save that kind of thing for other people's use. So I've priced the painting at $24,000, because that's how much the pills cost. I also did something really scary while my husband was sick. Um, I went to work at the toy store for three days, just because I needed to get away from the hospital for a little bit. And while I was there, I ran into an old customer of mine. And that customer of mine, um, she said, you need to meet this man uh, after I had told her I had he, my husband had kidney cancer. I said, who is the man I need to meet? She says, his name is E. Patient Dave. I met him in a medical conference. He's amazing. And you need to meet him. And I said, well, how do I meet Dave? And she says, well, you're going to need to get on Twitter. And I didn't know what Twitter was. So, so she says, well, find out tonight. And that night, I got on Twitter with the help of my 10-year-old autistic son. And I sent my first tweet. And if you know anything about Twitter, that's wrong. You don't do that, OK? There's these at symbols and stuff. And so, so what's amazing is David's so good, he found me from that tweet. And then he started tweeting to me and realized I was Twitter incompetent. And then he started to email me and call me on the phone. And by 10 o'clock that night, Dave had me talking with his doctor from Harvard about his care. And he talked with me and let me say everything that had happened to Fred so far. And it was amazing. Because he didn't interrupt. He just listened. And after I told him everything that was going on, Dave's doctor was really brave and said something nobody else had said so far. He said, sometimes we catch these things too late. Sometimes the best thing you could do is decide how to spend the end of a life. So we ended up having a short stint at rehab. We ended up going to get a blood transfusion at another hospital. At that hospital, the doctor in charge said, you know, your husband really should be in hospice. And I said, yeah, that's what I'm hearing. And so we worked on transfer. We went to hospice, and it was beautiful, and it was kind. And for three weeks, we had glory. Fred's pain was controlled, and all of a sudden, he could sit up, and he could eat again, and he could be with his friends. And then after three weeks, the discharge nurse came, and she said, so he's stable. We've got to talk about him going home. <laughs> I said, how are we going home? We have a one-bedroom apartment with two little kids. One has autism, one's three. How are we going home? It's not even handicap accessible. And the nurse said, well, have you considered moving? So we moved to a two-bedroom apartment. And for the last six days of Fred's life, I was his everything. I was his medical administration record. I was the one in charge of his care. After two days, the hospice nurse came and said, I'm not sure this is working out. He's a very challenged patient. I'm like, yeah. She said, maybe we should see about him going back. What? She said, well, that's how insurance works. You prove you can't stay home, and then you can go back. I'm like, no. He'll never move again. We moved to this apartment so he could be here. I will take care of him till the end. And after the sixth day, he cried out to me and said, Reggie, my catheter blew. We got the hospice nurse, and she placed a new catheter. And then she started sweeping our floor. And I said, you don't have to sweep our floor. And she said, you just go be with your husband. And here's some atropine drops for when he has trouble breathing. And then something amazing happened. It's called terminal restlessness. I thought that was a Tom Hanks film, but it's not. It's this moment where in some households and some people, they get really gated and it's not good and you might not spend the best end of a life. But with my husband, all of a sudden he was back. He was talking. He wanted to talk all night. We talked till dawn about our children and our life, about everything that had happened. And at 6.30 he turned to me and said, Reggie, you look tired. You should go to sleep. And I was, and I did, but I only slept for one hour because he was really compliant on his meds, and he had 7.30 meds. So I woke up, and I got his meds ready, but he wouldn't wake up, so I crushed them up and put them on his tongue and gave him something to drink. And he sucked those pills down, but he wouldn't open his eyes. His breathing had just got so slow. So I ran to my mother-in-law and my children, and we stood beside Fred, and we said, we love you, Daddy, and it is okay to go. And then he stopped. And friends took the children away. And the undertakers came, and the hospice nurse came, and they took away the body. And then we had a funeral service, and we had a memorial service. On Monday, I taught vacation Bible school. 
On Tuesday, I began to paint. I began to paint a really big painting in Washington, D.C. I began to tweet and blog and Facebook and post and tell everybody I knew about how important it was for patients to get access to information and people to be cared for. See that CVS that began our entire journey? The painting's right beside it. Every time I'd get drugs, I would look at the painting. It's 17 feet by 73 feet. There are 17 people in that painting, and not one of them is making eye contact with another. And all too often, that is the picture of care in this country. We dedicated the mural on October 20th of 2009 by singing songs from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And one of those songs are, where do we go from here? And that's my question for you. See, this is what I did next. I started painting about data sets. Um, I started painting about a data set about George Washington University Medical Center. We had never been treated there. No affiliation. It's just their scores were available, their HCAP scores, online in a data set. And it was a really cool building. And I wanted to paint right in front of it. Because when I read their HCAP scores for 2010, I was sort of floored that they were getting C's, D's, and F's in patient satisfaction. And as I was painting about it right in front of the hospital, all these people would come by and ask me, where did you find that out? I said, it's right there online. All you have to do is look at hospital.gov. You can make your choices about where you want to be cared for based on this kind of information. I also entered a competition called Body Shock the Future, where they're asking what rapid things can we do to make healthcare better. And I'm like, there's a really easy thing. Say I worked in preschool for years, right? So there's a little preschool child with their lunch pail, and they've sat it on top of a pink toilet. And that child looks at you with disgust. Because even a three-year-old knows you do not eat off a toilet. But here's a nurse with a tray of food, and she's getting ready to put it on a bedside tray table that still has the materials from incontinent bedding change. This is done all the time, all over the nation. And if just this one thing was fixed, imagine the lives we would save. You know, that kind of bedside tray table, which is pretty standard, pressed fiberboard with a melamine with a rubber bumper, you cannot disinfect it. There is no way to do that. C. diff spores will not come off that. So if you just change that to stainless steel or microbial steel, or God forbid, don't use it for both those things, right? Imagine the lives we would save. That's me. Meaningful use, July of 2010. I was on stage with Kathleen Sebelius and Don Berwick, David Blumenthal, and Regina Benjamin. We were talking about this new piece of legislation that would make sure patients, as a core measure, would be able to get the information. And now it's 2016, and I'm seeing a whole bunch of people push back on this. We don't need meaningful use anymore. We can use MIPS, we can use MACRA, we can do other things, but I'm noticing a definite push to, we need to get the patients out of all this, because there are definitely some troublemakers in there. See, there are institutions and organizations who want to do everything they can to stop the progress that is being made in patient integration within the care team. And we have to do what we can to defeat that attitude, because the future of healthcare is us all being in it together. This is a project called Open Notes. I heard about Open Notes back in 2010 because I was on Twitter, yay! And I was tweeting about the power of Open Notes and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation started tweeting to me, okay? And <laughs> we started talking about how powerful it would be if they open notes up. And they said, oh, wait a second, we're working on a study, pay attention. And in 2012, the data came out and it was amazing. Um, 90% of patients said that they understood what they had read. Only one to two percent were confused or concerned about it. 87% of patients did um, enroll in the study, did check their notes. Doctors in the study said it only moderately affected their work call, their workflow. And 80% of patients claimed greater adherence to medical protocols based on being able to read their notes. Okay, that's game changing. When one of the doctors talked about the one to two percent that were upset by what they read, he said, I was a doctor of one of those patients. And what had happened is he had read for the first time in his medical record that he was morbidly obese. So he called the doctor's office and he said, I just read in my mor medical record that I'm morbidly obese and I want that out of there. And the doctor said, we have a way of doing that. And 60 pounds later, it's not in there anymore. <laughs> okay? So even the bad stuff can be the good stuff. 
This is Dr. David Shearer. He is a major proponent of the idea that if you have an implantable device in your body, you should be able to get to that data. Right now, the data goes to the vendor that made the product and the doctor who's treating you, and the patient cannot access it. And we need to know this stuff. How about Bell and Health in Green Bay, Wisconsin? This is Betty Bundy, and I got to go out here there and meet her, and it was amazing. See, see, they had a good stroke program, and when they, <laughs> when the, do, the CEO in charge basically asked the stroke team, "How are we doing 18 months out?" They didn't know, so they called up Betty, one of their patients, and asked how she was doing. And they're like, "Hey, Betty, it's Bell and Health. How you doing?" And Betty said, "Oh, Bell and Health, you sucked. You almost killed me." You lost my medical record three times in four days. And you know, a lot of facilities would just walk away from Betty, right? Not Bellin. What they did was they had her come to a meeting like this one and sit her in a chair in the center and then ask her questions. And because Betty has complete filter failure, she answers them all. And she's amazing and truthful and spectacular. Everybody loves Betty. So when they changed their EMR system to a new vendor, they named it Betty and they put that picture on every single computer. And so if you hate the new rollout of Blah, you hate the new rollout of Betty. And all of a sudden, everything changed because everybody loved Betty and they understood why they were doing this rollout. This is Michael Graves. Unfortunately, we lost him last year. But he was a designer who had had a disorder that destroyed his lower spine. And it made him fall into the world of healthcare. And when he fell in, he started redesigning healthcare. And he created a universal hospital wheelchair that's amazing. And my hope is that his design team keeps up his spectacular work. Advice, adverse Childhood Experience Survey. This was done by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, and it's worn on the back of Matthew Holt's jacket. He wears around the nation. But the adver Adverse Childhood Experience Study is called ACEs, and the idea is if as a child you suffered through an adult who was abusive, used alcohol, had mental illness, there was a death in the home, if any of these things happened to you, your care is going to be impacted for the rest of your life. Yet when we triage patients, we don't ask these questions. And we should. Consumer reporting system for patient safety is a project that's now being rolled out regionally. If you want more information about it, Helen Haskell is one of the people on the team working on this. But the idea would be, if you were in a hospital and you feel that you're being abused, what if there was a number to call, a website to go to for when the abuse becomes too bad? Welcome to the walking gallery, telling the patient story one jacket at a time. This is a painting, a picture actually, of a whole bunch of walking gallery jackets at a meeting at Kaiser. Okay. This is a quote by Shepard Ferry, and I love it because it sort of explains some of the vision of the gallery. The more stickers that are out there, the more important it seems. The more important it seems, the more people want to know what it is. The more they ask each other, it gains real power from perceived power. There's this health conference called HIMSS that has like 40,000 people at it. I usually attend that and several other members of the walking gallery. Usually there's about 40 of us in a room of 40,000. And with just 40 of us, we've trended on Twitter every single year for the past three years. That's how many people talk about a painted story walking by and wondering what it means. These are two walking gallery jackets, and one is about a conference I put together called Partnership with Patients. The idea is that patients should also do conferences, invite all you, and it should be fun. And we should play musical instruments at them, because guess what? We are amazing, we have so many talents, if we could just let them all free. The other jacket, though, that's a coworker at the toy store, her name's Morgan, and it's a painting where she didn't get to say goodbye to her mother. See, she was a little bit sick when, her, when she went on a trip to Europe, but I don't think her mother understood how sick she was. And oftentimes, doctors don't talk about this the way they should. So Morgan's mom died while Morgan was away, and she never got to say goodbye. And that's her story. This is Teddy Tan's jacket. Teddy Tan's jacket is non-compliant. He's a doctor for Kaiser Permanente. And um, he's in the painting, and I'm in the painting. We both are bright with the bright, bright colors. And you'll notice all the other children are looking the other way, and we're not. And you're going to see so much in healthcare. There's a whole bunch of people who look the other way. They don't think it's their responsibility, and it is. We can change these things together. This is Keith Boone. He works on HL7 coding, and his jacket is literally about exploding silos. Because right now, the silos in healthcare, they're killing people, and we've got to change it. This is Dr. Nick. 
When he was in medical school, he was exhausted. So were many, many, many of his friends. They weren't sleeping. It was considered a pride and a badge of honor to work multiple shifts and never sleep. And one of his friends in the top of that hourglass, she jumped. We lose good people because we're not taking care of them. And it's not just the patients, it's the doctors too. This is Paula Pharmacy Pinball. This is a friend of mine who <laughs> tries to help so many. And so many of those people that she helps, she finds out they're on 12 to 16 different types of medication. And how can you make that work? How can you help those people so they don't go to the next step? Another friend, Christine Kurtz, her, doc her daughter had gone through addiction in her life. And then she got sick and was given some pain medication. And then on top of that, she fell and hurt her arm. And she tried to go to the doctor. And because <laughs> she had once had addiction, they wouldn't treat her. They treated her horribly. So notice all the arms broken off those statues. Because in a system of care, some people are considered drug-seeking even if they're hurt. How about this wonderful nurse, Mary Jo Shields? She's been fighting to get a treatment for her back for years now. So on this painting, you see a whole bunch of cracks and still children stepping on them because that's how you break your mother's back, right? And she's a nurse, and she feels the system has betrayed her. This is my son Freddie's jacket. See, he's that eye in the door crack over there. That's what he was in the mural, because that's how welcome he felt in healthcare. But when he joined the walking gallery, he said, Mom, paint a skull on top of a parking kiosk and put coins in the mouth and on the floor, because you shouldn't make a family pay to park while they're watching their daddy die. This is my son Isaac, the one I started with, the one who went to the clinic appointment, and he's marching He's marching <laughs> as we picket the American Hospital Association with bubbles and balloons and walk around them saying, the patients have a voice too, and we have the right to be part of the conversation. You see the jacket he's wearing? He painted that himself at the age of six. See, all these different organizations have interviewed me about the walk-in gallery, and I was really surprised when one of them was Wall Street Journal and Marketplace, and I tried to explain to them, I'm like, you understand that I paint these jackets for free. I don't charge for it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mission. We are trying to work together to make healthcare better. And what they told me was, <laughs> that's fine, but what you're doing is changing healthcare policy, and that changes economics. So remember, you have power, and it may be power on your back. This is an article on ePatients.net, and it says, Regina Holiday is not special. And I love this article, because I'm not. I was a special ed student who was super poor. I'm a single mom of special needs children. I live in rural Western Maryland in the foothills of Appalachia. I'm as non-special as I can get. Yet, I use every talent and ability I have to change healthcare and make it better. I am Little Miss A-type personality. You can take the most negative and horrible experience in your life and you can make it a positive. And all I ask for you is to join me on that journey. Thank you.